Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Alex Boyanju. He's a psychotherapist and he has been for over 30 years. And he has worked with a lot of different situations from couples to families, individuals, and working through all of life's challenges. And here's the interesting thing about Alex. His goal of therapy is to help you let go of outdated ways of living that can make you feel stuck or in survival mode so that you can live life in freedom, joy, and success. Now we have a fabulous conversation and we really get deep with some things, especially trauma. We talk about EMDR, we talk about what it means to be alive, and we talk about how trauma gets stored in the body and more of how it's the stories we hold, not the score compared to what the book says. So this is an enlightening podcast, a deep one, and we'll get you thinking. So let's introduce you to Alex Boyanju. Hey, Hell Junkies. I have Alex Boyanju on with me today. He's a psychotherapist. He's been in the gig for over 30 years. I guess we just said 32 to be exact. It's funny how time flies. And today we're going to be talking about a subject I have not talked about before, and I'm really excited to talk about it. Something called EMDR. And a lot of folks, Alex, have, have been telling me about like, hey, I've been trying this. It's been working really well. And so I think this is an opportune time to really talk about how EMDR works and get the backstory on, on you. So Alex, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Really excited. Looking forward to it. So how did you, in, in the scheme of things, come to becoming a psychotherapist and working with EMDR? Give us your backstory so everyone kind of has a little you know, get to know you a little better. Sure. Um, uh, it's, it's a strange, you know, from a personal level at, at a young age, I, I was just really curious about who I am, what is life, why we, why do we exist? You know, those existential kind of questions uh, at a really early age. And I had some kind of insights and breakthroughs in my consciousness at a at an early age that that uh, I w- was wanting answered, and um, I started to pursue that through some of the books that I started to read when I was a teenager. I met some spiritual te- teachers when I was also a teenager, and that kind of started the journey. And it's been you know full on throttle since that time, and uh, my whole life has just been a deep dive into the exploration of, of being a spiritual human being. Very cool. Very cool. I really wish that I would have tapped into my conscious understanding of myself and had questions when I was younger. All I had in the back of my mind was how can I become a professional snowboarder, which never happened. Um, (laughs) Here we are today, but I, I love it when I hear that folks were that connected and, and tapped in, you know, that, early in life that brings so much more of a rich experience to life but also to being able to share that with others yeah i mean it's nothing that i can say i own or it's unique to me (laughs) or something that i made or created it's just you know i don't know how it works i think this is the mystery some people get glimpses into it's like the wizard of oz you know some people get, get glimpses behind the the curtains at different phases, at different stages, different depths and so forth. And some people don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it just happens to be, you know, I do believe that at a certain point, if we start to um, do the work uh, the curtain gets pulled back more often and remains, you know, open. Um, so it, it, I'm not sure if it matters how many experiences we had, but once we have one glimpse, that could be enough to last us a whole lifetime of being curious and exploring what is, uh, what's most meaningful in being alive. Absolutely. Absolutely. So much in that, that statement right there, (laughs) you know, so much in that statement right there. And I think for a lot of us right now, walking on this earth, we have disconnected from what it means to be alive. What, what that even means, what that even kind of brings forth on us. And, and I think that might be some of the connection too to where trauma lies within our bodies and how we kind of store it, how we, you know, work with it as a whole. 
You know, human beings throughout history, I, I would say, I mean, I think we sometimes try to paint any, you know, golden ages and, uh, you know, disembodiment, embodiment. I, I wasn't around for thousands of years, so I don't, I don't know, you know, what was and what, I don't want to project some kind of golden era of sorts. The only thing I could say is from the anthropological studies of uh, hunter-gatherer tribes that we, we can study, they seem much more embodied. Mm -hmm. uh, because they live very embodied lives and they seem to be much more attuned to their bodies and they also seem much more connected to mother earth so there seems to be a relationship between embodiment and nature right mm -hmm. and then when we look at uh the movement from hunter gatherers into more agricultural and then science and technological movements uh, we're, we're we're getting away from embodiment and we're getting more into mind uh, arenas. And we can see that as mind arena, you know, uh, accelerates, we have a loss of contact with Mother Earth. And so we, we see this relationship between our anthropological evolutionary development, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, when we look at the most modern times, we are the most... Uh, separated uh that we have ever been and with technology now creating a multiverse um on 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 um, online where people can now interact with each other in virtual worlds i mean which is just all mine there is no embodiment whatsoever and so then when we look at our modern you know illnesses of both mind and body uh they arise out of a disembodied disembodied lives yeah right yeah and then yeah. you know trauma obviously you know uh impacts that ever so more right i mean we've been disembodied to begin with and then trauma disembodies us even further mm -hmm. so that's kind of like just to give a, a little bit of a framework of where we are at the moment absolutely absolutely and you know obviously here we are cross zoom you know recording this here even and in a in a world that I would I would love is to meet everybody in person and and sometimes I do get to do that outside of the podcast but yes it's one of those things where we we've lost that connection interpersonal but also yeah I I feel it when I haven't been outside and had my you know hands and feet in the dirt I I feel it on a deep level and I yeah, see you shaking I mean, your head if you, <laughs> if you look at our lives from the moment we wake up right where where are we making contact with nature right uh, return, returning to that source that nourishes us, right? It's it's so beautiful, you know, to reconnect. But, you know, we have to reconnect internally and externally. And if we don't know how to reconnect backwards in, internally, we're not going to know and see that the, you know, external is available to us an ex as an extension. So I think the journey has to begin with healing our wounds and our traumas and learning how to embody. And so that's why I would say for the last, you know, probably 40 years, uh, the embodiment movement has really picked up mm -hmm. and has been growing. You know, Wilhelm Reich, you know, in the 1950s and 60s was really starting to look at the, the body and its role in psychotherapy and healing because, you know, the psychoanalytic movement obviously was completely disembodied. Mm -hmm. And so it was this somatic movement and, and uh, Wilhelm Reich and some other other folks that were doing, you know, body centered work um, that uh, started to look at how do we heal from the inside out. And, you know, that coincided at the same time that yoga was coming to the West. So mm -hmm. when we look at the embodiment movement happening in the 50s and 60s, yoga then starts to come in. Uh, Buddhism starts to come in and all of that meets together to start to reawaken the body as an important, you know, avenue for healing. That's where that started. I, you know, I, I think a lot of people have seen it. They're, they're coming on board with it. And, and even folks have started to come into my office and, and even say like, Hey doc, I've been working on some things. I think that, you know, I've got trauma stuck in my body. Can you help me release it? I'm an acupuncture. So sometimes folks will, will kind of, you know, tap into that side of, of my practice and say, Hey, can, can we do 
acupuncture and, you know, and, and really for me, I, I really didn't start seeing a lot of this come into the medical field really until about the last 10 years. I don't think I, I mean, yes, I went to Bastyr. Yes, I'm a naturopath. We had a little bit more training than conventional docs, but even still on the same level, we were just like, it was two seconds of there's this EMDR thing. It's cool. And then like, you know, on to the next. And so I didn't get to explore as much of the concept of embodiment. I didn't get to explore as much of the concept of uh, of subconscious mind, things of that nature in school. I, I thought that maybe we would talk about it, but we didn't. And and so it's been a journey on my own of asking questions and and exploring more. So just to give folks a little background in, in what's happening in the medical field, you know, we're coming along, but even within the natural medicine space, it's not something that you get as part of your standard training. You've got to look elsewhere. And so I ask, of course, the, you know, most folks who I see on the podcast, like, okay, when did you first start learning about EMDR? When did you first start learning about trauma, things of that nature in terms of your field, but also in terms of your own exploration? I, I knew early on that okay. I wanted to do somatic therapy because um, I was an athlete. I, 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 I was a yoga person and I, I, you know, I became a yoga teacher at a very early age. And I knew the power of, of that. And so I actually trained with probably the first system, maybe in the United States, possibly. I don't want to be quoted exactly, but I think it was the first system called Phoenix Rising Yoga Therapy. Mm. And this was, oh God, 80s, early 90s. Like this was right there. I don't remember any other systems that were being offered as a full comprehensive system. And the way that this worked was that we were using yoga breath work to help people release traumas, understand traumas and become embodied. And it was beautiful, 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 the training. And um, I got to work with people early on in my career, immediately doing that work. And I could not believe um, how powerful it was, you know. So that was that was my first introduction. And once I, once that started going, I was just like, fully in and I started to study bioenergetics, Hakomi, uh, I mean, it goes on, you know, uh, somatic processing. I, I mean, literally every system that was on, I threw myself into. So I'm very familiar with the somatic, somatic field. You know? Wow. So I think a lot of people might be going, okay, somatic field, how does that relate, you know, specifically? Because most folks' experience of psychotherapy is they go in, they sit down, they talk, they talk about all the traumas, they talk about all the things, and then they leave. And sometimes there may be, depending on the the folks that they're working with, there may be some homework, there may be something to focus on. But a lot of times I've found that it's just rehashing over and over again the right. the traumas so tell us a little bit more about how you're incorporating in embodiment incorporating in emdr things of that nature how, how does it work and then of course we we want to i want to talk about what is emdr and all that i've been saying it over and over again <laughs> so i i'd like to back up and to do a, a little bit of an understanding of what it means to be human yes so when when we're being developed in utero the nervous system is is the is the interface between the muscular system, the skeletal system, and then on the inside, on the on the subtle energy and the the body that we cannot see, the energy body. So if we think about the nervous system, it's the interface between the energy system and the manifest system of bones, density, muscles, cellular, and so forth, right? So the nervous system is such a, an, a, a it's just absolutely mind-blowing. It's this living, alive, intelligent, I don't know, mechanism. And it is what receives information, deals with information, and then has output, right? And it connects to the mind, to the emotions and the body. So the nervous system is, is 
picking up information all the time, all the time. That's what starts to happen because as a human being, our first primary goal is to survive. Mm -hmm. That is the first primary goal. In order to thrive, we have to get through just an incredible amount of survival. I mean, you, you think about it, like nine months being formed with the most miraculous cellular endocrine. I mean, like talk about miracle of, of, of coming into being, right? All of that is, is, it has, has the interface of this nervous system and it's picking things up and it's forming, it's forming the body as information, it's forming the mind, even though the mind is not sort of say operating as an I am at this point. So in utero, and Stanislav Grof has done a lot of work around this, that the mother's energetic system is influencing the early formation of this nervous system. It's getting input. So the mother's nervous system the mother's emotions, her, you know, blood work and uh, cytokines and inflammatory markers, just everything is going into the baby and giving information. What is this early environment like? If the nervous, start, nervous system starts to pick up that it is starting to be unsafe, which it will, it's going to start to create rigidities already formations around patterns of relating and it starts that early it's incredible mm -hmm. right so the child is then born into the next environment next environment is the family environment the socio-political uh cultural environment right each one with, with its own unique vibrations Growing up in China is very different than growing up in South America. I mean, you know, like each country actually has its vibrations and it gets into the child's formation and it creates crusts and points of disconnection. So the way we think, we always assumed um, historically that trauma or was these big events, the big traumas, mm -hmm. as we always think, you know, um, sexual traumas, physical abuse, you know, violence in the home, addiction, the, you know, we can name all the, what we call the big T's, right? Right. But just being, being human, there's no escaping from the biological systems that are around us that are in their own confusion, they're in their own pain, in their own hurt, in their own uh, capacities, lack of capacities to deal with, with life, Right. All of that is coming in and forming the nervous system. Just imagine that. And that's already, that's trauma in the sense the small t's are basically saying it's safe or unsafe to be me. This mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many of us can say we grew up in an environment we were, where we felt like I could be authentically myself? I don't know anyone. <laughs> very good. It's uh, it's very small, very, very tiny, very, very tiny amount of adults will say, I, you know, really felt like so respected and so loved to be authentically myself. There are people, I mean, they're very fortunate, but it's a very small number. And mm -hmm. so then the rest of us grew up, grew up in varying degrees from little to the most violent where there is no room to be myself. So trauma is the encrusting around my authentic self. And basically what happens in that crusting, it's information that says I cannot be myself and I need to wear this crusting and create a distance from myself and others. And I have to wear this jacket to, to get through life and get along. But fundamentally, the way I experience myself underneath that is I feel alone and disconnected from myself and others. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see almost everybody coming to see me for. A deep disconnection from themselves and from others, not because it's their fault. It's what was what has occurred 
throughout life. And the, what's, you know, the, the, the secondary injury is that once the momentum of this happens, we then unconsciously continue to reinforce it. Right. Yeah. Again, not because we want to. It's just habit. It's just how we then function. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating system, right? That mm -hmm. carries itself along. And then we're shocked that, you know, the third relationship that we've had in our 20s is the same thing as the first one. And we're like, what happened? Right. You know what I mean? Why do I have such bad luck? You know, we'll ask that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no such thing. And then finally, <laughs> there comes a point where we go, hold on a second. I have to explore what role I play in my life in its well-being or its suffering. And then that is the beginning of the healing journey. Mm. Taking, taking accountability, accepting that you have a play in that is huge. It's huge. I find that, and I'm curious as to how you find some folks in terms of coming to this conclusion. Sometimes it's, I find that not a lot of folks, not let's, let's say this more and more are becoming ready to dive in, but there is still some resistance to this, of course. Look, I think that by the time people come to see me, they're sick and tired. So mm -hmm. I, I'm getting people, you know, at a point of where they want transformation. Do you know what I mean? But we could also, we also could look around in our lives and there's plenty of people that we know, family members and friends who are continuing in the momentum of their confusion and suffering with no actual desire to investigate themselves. And it's all life and others that are causing my suffering. And that's just a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, obviously part of this podcast for me is always helping folks to, to open their eyes to new things, new possibilities, things of that nature. Of course, by the time, you know, someone's coming to is sick and tired of things that they, they have come down a really long realization of, of, wow, maybe there's a pattern that keeps repeating and maybe I have a play in this, this sort of thing. And, and definitely with, with addictions, I, I see that that's something else that you, you specialize in. Can we talk a little bit about how that plays out in addictions? Yeah. I mean, if you look at what I described, addiction basically is the attempt to deal with the encrusting ineffectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's as simple of an explanation without getting fancy at all. That's what's happening. Right. And so because it's too painful to go into the crust and to deal with all the things that are there, it's ineffective and it, it, it doesn't it doesn't actually go to heal it. It just goes to numb it. Mm -hmm. So addictions are numbing of the encrusting. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. I hope that I mean, me simplifying it makes sense to everybody. It does to me. I mean, it definitely does to me and, and probably less is more when it comes to our bodies, because there's so much information out there right now that we have access to that it can almost hold us in a place of paralysis, you know, versus action or, or in, and I don't even mean the word action. Like I think confusion maybe might be more better word than la less of action, not knowing which direction to go. Once there's enough, hopefully, you know, we all need a different amount of suffering to get us to that space to start to include ourselves in the process. But like I said, I, I've known people who have died in their 70s and 80s uh, and have never examined their lives. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's what's, what's that saying? An unexamined life is not worth living, right? Or an examined life is the only life worth living, right? So the potential for healing is so beautiful. You know, when people start to taste, you know, relief and healing where that crust starts to, you know, peel away and fall away, it's like, oh, it's like, wow. I, I think I, I think I'm addicted uh, to watching people's relief. Mm -hmm. That's my addiction, you know, to to observe that process. It's just incredible. Hmm. And, you know, because once once they start to taste that. They're like, I never imagined that this is possible. And of course, 
it's hard to imagine it when you know we're within the encrusted lens it's very difficult to imagine any other way of viewing something so here comes emdr right so let, let's bring in emdr at this point to take a look at how emdr helps with shifting perspectives so you know people can look up emdr it, there's, there's a lot about it but I, i'm going to give a, a short a short summary of it <laughs> so it makes sense uh, the acronym stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, but let's leave let's leave that alone. So, um, as we were engaging in the wars in in the 1900s, and uh, vets were coming home, and there was uh, witnessing of patterns of suffering, which eventually was titled. PTSD. Before that official title, you know, we didn't understand what PTSD and veteran syndromes were. People were coming back and we didn't know what to do with that, right? And so we saw psychosis, um, 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 drug addiction, alcohol addiction, all sorts of addictions, suicide rates, right? And th these were all the impacts of being in war and traumatized. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as the field progressed and there was a naming of this syndrome called PTSD, uh, the treatments were were still very, um, very poorly effective, quite, quite not so effective. The idea was the early cognitive behavioral was you do exposure therapy. And what eventually we found out was that that's not the correct way uh, to deal with that and all other forms of PTSD and traumas, right? So uh, Francine Shapiro, about 25 years ago, was the woman who developed this uh, uh, through an insight that, that she had. And the way that EMDR works is that it consists of something called bilateral, either tapping or moving of the eyes. And so what happens in this tapping or eyes or any bilateral, uh, process is the brain goes into a slightly hypnotic state and in that hypnotic state the emotions that arise in a particular trauma are slightly calmer and when the emotions are slightly calmer the person can actually perceive the event in a more uh, objective light and by witnessing the event in a more objective light, they can actually see who they were actually in that. So you take a child who, let's say, has some trauma. Most of the time, they will believe that it was their fault. Mm -hmm. And so I just had a session before this, and this gentleman, you know, his his you know his mother was was uh, quite ill and caused a lot of trauma and and drinking, and he would believe that it was his fault that she was drinking right then during emdr we revisit that while tapping and all of a sudden he realizes oh my goodness this had nothing to do with me it wasn't my fault i'm a good person and then what happens is we learn to embody to feed here comes the somatic part then we support him through a meditative way of experiencing his own wholeness and freedom and through love to come back to himself and realize it wasn't his fault. Mm -hmm. So that's the short version of the way that EMDR works. Okay. Okay. So a lot of the people listening right now will be like, okay, so we're going back to childhood. We're going back in time. Anywhere anywhere it doesn't matter it could be yesterday right okay. we're, we're 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 bringing up memories that are still lodged in in the psyche and the body that have not been resolved and been given see the body and the and the mind wants to put everything in its right space mm -hmm. when when it's misplaced it just keeps arising in the unconscious as well through sicknesses and illnesses and misperceptions and aggressions and angers and reactions, emotional disturbances and so forth. All of those are symptoms of trauma not being correctly worked out. 
Mm-hmm. So we use these memories and we activate them in the body to allow them to be released, but with the right objective distance and perspective. Okay. Okay. And then, and then the brain can then put it in its right space without all of the emotional activation. Because what happens is when you then have a memory without the emotional activation, what do you have? It's just, it's just a memory, just a visual. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I saw when I was in, when I was 21, I saw someone get violently killed in front of me. Oh. And and um, I, I never had MDR, but I think just my temperament is that when I have that memory now and since 21, when I had the memory, I have the memory, but I don't have any emotional reaction to the memory except compassion for the young man who died. Do you know what I mean? But it doesn't destroy my day or anything. It actually inspires me to live more fully. Right. So I I didn't feel it was my fault. I'm bad or some kind of I am that was involved that was distorted. Right. So that's a trauma that was correctly digested by my system. Does that make sense? It does. It does. One of the things that I've kind of dove into and really something you mentioned was the emotional attachment to what you saw. And then, of course, we give things meaning, right? And then we have emotion. Then we have the next wherever we store it. So if we're looking at that, and and I'm guessing beyond that, other traumas have happened because we all have the big T's and the little T's. Has it been your habit just out of understanding how the body works and and how things work to not attach emotion? Because, I mean, you mentioned compassion, but to not attach emotion, give things meaning. What's... What would I, I guess what I'm asking is what's what could be the the learning lesson here from what you experienced and what others you know what what happens with others I guess that can't <laughs> disconnect let's put, let's put it this let's put it this way um it's not that you can actively choose a particular emotional response when a trauma is happening right that's not what we're talking about it's Everybody's got a different temperament and already a whole entire system that, so take, take this system from childhood that has been wired a certain way, bring it into adulthood. And let's say take 10 of those different systems all the way from stable internally to quite unstable. And the same event happens to them. Each person will integrate that event based on their previous historical trauma patterns right so their emotional response is dictated by previous emotional responses okay this is important to understand right yeah so what we what i think we all should be curious about is how we respond to everyday life's events and to see you know how much weight what's our perspective you know, how much emotionality is it really? Like sometimes step back and be like, interesting, like, wow, that's that's an interesting, very intense response, right? And then do some processing with that, right? Okay. I'm I'm following you now. I'm following you now. And I think I think other folks may be too, in terms of like, okay, obviously we all respond different. We all have, you know, the the information that we've learned over the years and 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 how we right. you know how we respond to certain things. Now something happens. The goal is to understand yourself enough to be able to process differently. It's hard to do it during it, but afterwards. So, you know, an event happens and you've been curious about yourself and you go, wow, that's so interesting. The way I lensed it, Mm -hmm. the way I said, my responsibility, that person's responsibility, the way I storied, storied it, right? Very, very important. You know, you know, like let's say you're at work and your coworker says, "Yeah, I'm not really happy the way you you did that today. That 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 you know, uh, those photocopies, the way you did that. I'm not really happy with that." And one person comes home and goes, "Whatever." Tomorrow I'll do it better. Another person, "Oh my God, I cannot believe it. I think they hate me." And Oh, no, no, my world's going to fall apart, right? So you know how that goes. Everybody's got a different response to that event. Yes, 
I laugh. I laugh only because I'm the one that the the world's going to fall apart if I did something wrong. And I, and right. you know, <laughs> and, and I'm, for those of you listening, I'm only laughing because it's me. It, you know, I'm, it's no disrespect to anyone. I only know what I experience. And part of it is entertaining in that I've done enough self-exploration to go into, okay, why do I have that experience? And I know it comes from my dad. And I know it comes from certain things I learned. And with him still being alive, still here, but now I can put that barrier into to this. And so I think what I'm going for here is how does it work for folks now in terms of those responses? We can catch ourselves. How, how do you teach folks to catch their responses? How do you teach folks to work backwards from or, or how, however you explain it? A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of mindfulness practice, a lot of meditation practice, because the, the, the signs that were activated in a particular trance mode begins in the body. The body gives us uh, the energetic body starts to vibrate a certain way that starts to give a clue that this is the beginning of the trauma response, mm-hmm. right? Once we are really aware, we can actually witnessing it arising. And then if we're really attuned, we can watch it arise, but not react then to it. We can, Simply, it's just like witnessing, arising. We, we smile, we go, hi, old friend. Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> right? And then it comes through, you let it go, and then you're like, yep. I don't need to deal with it that way. And I have new ways to deal with it that are much more effective, much more in line with who I am and respective of the other person, right? Mm -hmm. So lots of tuning in to the somatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we're we're trying to do this from the headspace of the mind, it's very difficult because the mind is like the last place where the symptoms are occurring of the trauma response. The body is the first. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people paying attention to when something comes up, looking to see where it lands in the body is where I'm gathering. That's right. You know, where, where does it show up in the body? What does that signify? What is the story in, in that response? What is the particular I am? Uh, What's the goal? What are the fears? I mean, there's a, there's a, the, the, you know, the book, the body keeps a score by Basil van der Kolk, right? So the body keeps the keeps the story, not the score, but the story. That's what it should have been the name of the book. It keeps <laughs> the story, right? So that response has an entire book there. If you know how to read the book, you know how to heal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I th- I think this is something that I've come to after a long time of of obviously being a doc, going on you know nineteen years this year, but really just kind of looking at huh, okay, you know, a lot of what happens to us is a result in in terms of symptoms, things of that nature are a result of past past traumas and behavior, subsequent behaviors and habits that lead to those is kind of what I've summed it up as. It's not that that just randomly happened to you that you have abdominal pain or gut issues. Look at the word, look at the word disease. It comes from the word dis- ease well when the body is not at ease it becomes sick so if we want to take a look at why we're sick we have to look at why we are diseased absolutely absolutely so moving through folks understanding this, you know, concept of disease, understanding that they're storing different emotions, thoughts, traumas, et cetera, in their body. I have heard, and, and I want you to kind of help us with understanding this, because I've heard a lot of people say EMDR helps me get these things out of my body. And, I, you know, we've already kind of talked about how that's not necessarily the the concept, but I think what folks are wanting to understand is how does eye movement help to bridge the gap there with the neurological system and help with, with yeah. correcting. Don't, don't, don't worry about the eye movement or the tapping simply understand that all of the, all bilateral movements induce a hypnogenic state. That's, that's the most important. The science <laughs> on, on that is evol- ever, ever evolving. 
But if you look at traditional societies, Native American people would dance around the fire and you would see them stomping. If yeah. you look, if you look at the Sufis and the way they're dancing and they do the call to prayer, they're doing it uh, bilaterally. So there is, I think there's something in human beings that, that has uh, something to do with the crossover in the brain in bilateral movements, inducing, inducing hypnotic states. And if you look at the Sufis that are doing these, they're doing this dance and they're making contact with the divine. What that means is that they're blissing out completely and letting go, in this case, of what we would call from the default mode network, right? So the, a hypno, the hypnogenic state is basically turning off the default mode network. Well, the default mode network is basically all the stored uh, belief systems of self in the mind that are inaccurate. And so these hypnogenic states, basically they, they go lights off on that and then you experience absolute bliss. And that's why people like to use all sorts of, of psychedelics because psychedelics and ketamine and so forth, those actually work exactly the same way is by turning off the default mode network. And so when we do that, people experience euphoria and bliss and so forth and so forth. But it does not mean that they are actually transforming the underlying psychic structures and the bodily health experiences because that moment has occurred. That moment is just to give you the clue of what is possible. Mm. I'm glad then, you explained that. Go ahead. Comes the hard work. Yeah. Yes. I think you know. I think it's come to. Uh, let's say it this way. I think it's come to my understanding, at least based on how how it's discussed in my office. Is a lot of folks think that the ketamines, the psilocybins, you know, all of these different you know ayahuasca treatments are going to purge whatever it is, or they're going to see the solution and then all is good after doing those. And unfortunately, like you said, not the case. This is, this is not about purging. This notion that it's really interesting that we have this idea like yeah. purging and then I'm good. And, and, and I understand it because we want to throw up all that's being held within us, right? So during those hypnogenic states, right? Yes, there's a sense that we've purged, but what it's done is that we just turned the system off temporarily, right? Mm -hmm. And But in order to turn that system off like longer times and eventually completely transform it, oh, that's a lot of work. Steady, day in and out, embodiment and meditation and coming back home again and again, again and again. And to be honest with you, we're very lazy and we want all of this to be resolved and to return back to our true nature and our inner homes and, and just like this. So, you know, if, if we're going to be lazy, well, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I mean, we, we've unfortunately kind of moved into a society since probably the antibiotics were, were developed of here's the pill. Here's quick, your solution. Quick, the quick, quick fix. You know, I'm going to go on an ayahuasca trip. I'm going to come back. I've seen people come back from ayahuasca trips and have the most amazing trips, and they're the same, same as they were before. Yes, yes, yes. Not that people haven't had insights or some transformation. I, I, I mean, obviously, but 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 then you know, it's not like you're going to keep going to them for the full transformation. There's a lot of work that has to be done, and I really, you know, I, I, without having a guide to do this transformation healing, I don't care. You know, a, a religious person, a psychotherapist, uh, 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 a spiritual teacher, uh, a coach, like somebody who knows what they're doing to guide you. You can't do this by yourself. Just like I just like, you know, I can't do certain things for myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to fix my own car. What about. So I always like to ask folks, like, who's who's your mentor? Who's your guru? Who's your guide out of curiosity? Or do you have multiple? Uh, throughout my lifetime, I've had several. Uh, at, at the moment, I have my my most beloved teacher, Lopon Barbara Dubois, who is a an amazing Buddhist teacher out from Arizona. And she is, uh, you know, she's everything to me. I've heard her name before. I've heard her name before. Not sure why. 
but um, perhaps in some circles, but very interesting. You know, I, I always like to hear who's, 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 you know, guide or mentor, because I think it's important for folks to understand that all of us have, well, at least most of us, I should say that are in the space of working with others and wellness and, right. and should have a guide. <laughs> I, 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 I am with her on a regular basis, either in person or on, on Zoom. And we're, we're, we're connecting and deepening and deepening uh, that contact with, with uh, the quality of being whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for folks who are listening at this point, Alex, and, and they're kind of going, okay, I, I'm ready to start this process of really taking the next step to figure out who I truly am, you know, work through things. I want to do the hard work. What would you advise them to do as their first step? And, and of course, we'll get into how they can work with you as well. Look, I'm biased in a sense that um, I, for me, if they want the, the, the quick ist, quick ist way is somebody who does embodied somatic psychotherapy and knows EMDR. If I'm going to combine, those would be the two, like, secret weapons. Uh, talk therapy for me is, sorry, I'm going to do this for the people, but it's a waste of time. Okay. I would find somebody who really knows how to do that well. And then, you know, someone you connect with, who you trust, and begin the process. Makes sense. Makes sense. And then, if they're looking to work with you. How does that work? Simple. You know, my website, journeytowholeness.health, easiest way. They can read all about me, all my all my stuff on there, and uh, they can send me a, a text or an email, and I'll get back to them. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, we've had a very interesting conversation, went down a lot of different avenues. I appreciate you taking the time and being real with us, because I think for a lot of folks, this is going to be an eye-opener for them to to hear how it really is in, in working through our, our traumas and getting to know ourselves. Thank you very much. And, you know, what I would say is this, healing is possible for all of us. It's very important. You're not, none of us are doomed to the conditioning that was. We all have the capacity to be fundamentally free. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Well, well said. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. We'll uh, definitely be digesting this one and, and thinking about it and having a good conversation going forward. So thanks again, Alex, for coming on. Thanks a lot. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.